In this short video, I'm just going to go over the solutions to our study guide for test one. In our first question, we're given a graph and we're asked some questions about limits as x approaches various values of the function represented by that graph. So let's just go through it. Uh, here in 1a, my first question is the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x. And we have to use the graph here. So if I look on the graph where x approaches 2, whether I'm approaching from the left or from the right, I'm approaching the same point which has a y coordinate of 1. So the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is going to be 1. All right, the limit as x approaches 0, again, whether I'm coming from the left or I come from the right, I'm going to be approaching the origin. And so the y-coordinate there is 0, so the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x is going to be 0. All right, um, in C, we have the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x. So when x equals 1, we can see that there is a jump. And so when I'm on the left side of 1, I'm on this branch. And as I approach 1 from the left, the y-coordinates approach the number 2. So the limit as x approaches 1 from the left is going to be 2. All right, and D, we have the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x. Well, we can see that as I approach negative 1, from the left, I'm getting closer to 1. The y-coordinates are getting closer to 1. If I come from the right, the y-coordinates are getting closer to negative 1. And since the left limit does not equal the right limit, then the limit does not exist. So we can put D and E does not exist. And then I'll just make a little note here that the left limit does not equal the right limit. Okay. And let me just erase part of that because we can reuse the highlighting for the next question. We'd like to know what is the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right. That's the branch that has the highlighting. And we can see that as the x-coordinates approach negative 1 from the right, the y-coordinates on the graph approach negative 1. Okay, and then our last limit question here is the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. Approach 1 from the right. This branch of the graph, as we get closer to 1 from the right, the y-coordinates are getting closer to negative 1. Let's look at the next question. We want to 
list all discontinuities of the function f of x shown in the graph above and the, then describe each type of discontinuity. And let's just go from left to right. So we don't have any asymptote, even though it looks like this uh, portion of the graph is going down um, forever without bound. It's also going slightly to the left, so there's no asymptote uh, at the far left. However, we do have this jump at negative 1. So we're going to write that here. x equals negative 1 as a discontinuity at x equals negative 1. And that is a jump discontinuity. And then we follow the graph further to the right and we see that there is another jump at x equals 1. And further to the right we see there is a hole and that's not what we call the discontinuity when the graph has a hole that's at x equals 2. We call it a removable discontinuity. And that's all the discontinuities in, that are shown in the graph for that function. All right, so here we're going to use the limit laws and related theorems, which is telling me that I can't just plug numbers into a calculator. I can't graph it somewhere else and then just look at the picture. I'm going to use the limit laws and related theorems. And if it turns out the limit doesn't exist, we'll just say why. All right, in A, we're going to take the limit as x approaches negative pi of pi over x squared times cosine of x over 4. Now, this is a continuous function. And since we know we have a continuous function at negative pi, then I can just use direct substitution to evaluate this limit. And so this limit value is going to be pi over Oops. parentheses negative pi squared times cosine of negative pi over 4. And so this will be pi over pi squared, which is simplifies to being 1 over pi. And then cosine of negative pi over 4 is the same as cosine of pi over 4. Remember, cosine is an even function, and so that would be times root 2 over 2. So I guess I can clean that up as root 2 over 2 pi. In B, we have the limit as x approaches 1 of quantity x squared minus x over quantity x squared minus 1. This function is not continuous. It's not defined when x equals 1, but we should be able to calculate the limit. Let's start by factoring the numerator and the denominator. And we see that we have a common factor of x minus 1. So x minus 1 divided by itself 
is a form of one. And so this is going to reduce to the limit as x approaches one of x over x plus one. And now this is continuous when x equals one, I can use direct substitution and get the answer one half. Now, one hint is that uh, whenever I see a function that has a common algebraic factor in the numerator and the denominator, so I mean a factor that involves the variable, that is a hint to say that you have a removable discontinuity. So we had a removable discontinuity in this function when x equals one, uh, but we were still able to evaluate the limit by simplifying the fraction. Let's move on to part C. We're going to calculate a one-sided limit in this question, we're going to calculate the limit as x approaches three from the left of two over x minus three. Now, we can see that this function is not defined when x equals three. In fact, we're going to have a vertical asymptote. And so uh, from one side, from the left side, We'd just like to know, is the uh, function going to approach positive infinity or negative infinity? Well, let's just choose some values which are to the left of three and see if the values are positive or negative. So for example, if I were to put in 2.5 here or 2.9, I would see that the denominator would be a negative number. The numerator is always positive. So positive over negative is going to be a negative number. And so as the x values get closer and closer to three from the left, this is going to tend towards negative infinity. Finally, in part D, we might have to do a little bit more work here. Um, I have that the limit as x approaches negative two of quantity x squared minus four over the absolute value of x plus two. This function is not defined when x equals negative two, so I'm going to have to do some algebra. Let's start by factoring where we can. Uh, the limit as x approaches negative two of x plus two times x minus two all over the absolute value of x plus two. Now, I'm gonna to have to remember that I can think of the x absolute value function as a piecewise defined function. So recall that if what's inside the absolute values is positive, when we evaluate it, we don't do anything to it. However, if we have a negative value, we have to change the sign. So that would tell me that x plus two 
x minus 2 in parentheses over absolute value of x plus 2 is going to equal, well, it'll be x plus 2 times x minus 2. all over x plus 2 if x is greater than or equal to negative 2. And it will be parentheses x plus 2, parentheses x minus 2, all over minus parentheses x plus 2. if x is less than negative 2. So now we can calculate the left limit and the right limit independently. The uh, limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right, that's my top branch here, I'll notice that this is going to simplify. So I originally had x plus 2 over x minus 2 all over absolute value x plus 2. If I'm coming from the right, I can simplify that to being the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right of just x minus 2. 2. And I can use direct substitution to get negative 4 for the left limit. Well, now I should calculate the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left of what I originally had parentheses x plus 2, parentheses x minus 2, all over absolute value x plus 2. If I'm coming from the left, then I still have a simplification, but I have to realize that I have a negative sign now, so I still can simplify have a common factor of x plus 2, but what's left over would be negative parentheses x minus 2. And so when I use direct substitution here, I'm going to get positive 4. And I can say that since the left limit is not equal to the right limit. limit does not exist. All right, let's see what else we can do here. Oh, I have the same page because I thought I might have needed extra space, but let's move on to question three. Okay, we have two functions here, f and g, and we're asked to find the value of b which makes f of x continuous when x equals 1. So the x equals 1 is the only point where there could possibly be a discontinuity because if I am to the left of 1, 
I have a polynomial for my formula. And if I'm to the right of one, I have a different polynomial. But certainly for any value except one, f of x must be continuous. If we want f of x to be continuous when x equals 1, uh, we must ensure that the left limit equals the right limit. So let's go ahead and calculate those limits and then choose a value of b to make them equal to each other. So I'm going to calculate the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x. That would be the limit as x approaches 1 from the left. To the left of x, I'm using the formula 4 minus x squared. And so that is just going to give me um, 3. All right. Let's calculate the limit approaching from the right. The limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x would be the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of b minus 2x, which will give me the formula b minus 2. I simply replace the x value with 1. The b doesn't change. b is just a constant. So now, if I want my left limit to equal my right limit, then I'll need to solve the equation 3 equals b minus 2. And that tells me that b must equal 5. So that was our solution to part A. And in part B, we want to choose a value of C, which makes G of X have a removable discontinuity at X equals 4. So what we're saying here is we want X minus 4 to be a common factor in the numerator and the denominator. And so well, if I have a common factor of x minus 4, and then if I, in the numerator, have another factor of x plus 4, so thinking about the difference of two squares, then I would have x squared minus 16 in the numerator, x minus 4 in the denominator. Since they have a common factor of x minus 4, the limit as x approaches, um, and when x approaches 4, is going to be 8. Uh, but the function will not be defined there. So the value that we want to choose for C is going to be 16. In the next question, we have to use the squeeze theorem. So remember, the squeeze theorem is saying that we are going to sandwich our function between two values or two other functions and uh, the limit of the outer function, so the limit below and the limit above as x approaches our target value, 0, should be the same. So let's start with part A here. And we have a sine function. And what do we know about the sine function? Well, I can say this sine function is not defined when x equals 0. But when x is not 0, I can say two things. I can say that the uh, sine 
of 1 over x to the power of 6 is going to be between positive 1 and negative 1. And I can say that x to the power of 8 is positive. Why is that important? Because the first statement is important so that we can start to build our upper and lower bounds. And then the second statement is important so that we know that when we multiply by x to the power of 8, we're multiplying by a positive number. And since we have inequalities here, multiplying by a positive number is not going to change the inequalities. And so in fact, that's what I want to do next is I want to take my original bounds here, so negative 1 less than or equal to sine of 1 over x to the power of 6 less than or equal to 1. And then I'd like to multiply all three parts, left, middle, and right, by x to the power of 8. In particular, that gets me in the middle the function that I'm interested in. So that will give me negative x to the power of 8 less than or equal to x to the power of 8 sine of 1 over x to the power of 6 less than or equal to positive x to the power of 8. colon here, make my grammar a little bit better. And now I can say, state my conclusion. I'm going to say, since negative x to the power of 8 is less than or equal to x to the power of 8 sine of 1 over x to the power of 6, which is less than or equal to positive x to the power of 8. And the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x to the power of 8 is the same as the limit as x approaches 0 of x to the power of 8, both of those equal 0, then by the squeeze theorem, The limit as x approaches 0 of the middle function, x to the power of 8, sine of 1 over x to the power of 6, is also going to equal 0. Let's do the part B, and then we're going to take a break. So in part B, we're going to start with the same type of inequality as we did in part B. We're going to go ahead and note that when x is not equal to 0, that uh, cosine of pi over x squared is between negative 1 and positive 1, and x to the power of 4 is positive. So now I can take my inequality, 1 less than 
sorry, I made a mistake. Obviously, negative 1 is on the left and positive 1 is on the right. So negative 1 less than or equal to cosine of pi over x squared, which is less than or equal to positive 1. And I can multiply all three parts of that inequality by x to the power of 4. That's a positive number. So I don't change the inequalities. And I get my sandwich. Negative x to the fourth less than or equal to x to the fourth cosine of pi over x squared less than or equal to positive x to the fourth. Now let me write my conclusion. Since negative x to the fourth is less than or equal to x to the fourth cosine of pi over x squared less than or equal to positive x to the fourth comma and the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x to the fourth is the same as the limit as x approaches 0 of x to the fourth. And both of those limits equal 0. Then by the squeeze theorem, The limit as x approaches 0 of x to the power of 4 cosine pi over x squared equals 0. So notice that in both of these solutions, we start off with an inequality. We, from the inequality, we're able to create our function sandwich which has our function in the middle. But in the end, we have to write using proper English and complete sentences with correct punctuation, a conclusion, which is going to repeat what we just derived over here in terms of our function sandwich. It's going to state what the limit values are for the outer two functions, and they have to equal each other. And then it's going to state that we are using the squeeze theorem to conclude that the limit value for the middle function is the same as the limit value for the outer functions. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to make a second video and maybe, if needed, a third video to present the other solutions.